Hi, Michael. Hi, Emily. <laughs> Welcome back to the kitchen table. It's good to be here. <laughs> we have just recorded an episode of the podcast with John Lowry. He is a quantity surveyor by trade, a registered adjudicator, and an extraordinaire of all things tech and computer space, particularly to do with blockchain, Web3 developers, uh, smart contract applications. He is the man to go to. Um, Before we jump into the episode, um, we just want to pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land that which we're recording on, which is the Turrbal and Jagera people. And um, pay our respects to the elders, both past, present and emerging. So in this episode, um, you've known John for a while, haven't you, Michael? I have several decades uh, and I've always found him highly engaging, um, a futuristic thinker, um, which is almost like he's, his time has come now. Um uh, because people are looking to, to do different things in the construction industry to what has been always done. So John is always is always entertaining and challenging in his views and, uh, yeah, good person to listen to. Mm, yep, he blew me away. So in this episode we, um, without giving anything away, talked about smart contract applications, um, the importance of and uh, benefits of bringing in rules-based shared financial data and much, much more. So um, without further ado, I say we jump in. Let's do it. (laughs) Let's do it. Welcome, John, to uh, the Deconstruction Podcast and our Uh, kitchen table. Thank you for joining us on the episode. Thank you, Emily, and it's lovely to join you. Um, So, John, why don't we start the episode by uh, learning a bit more about who you are and um, your career. You are a quantity surveyor by trade. That's correct. I started... uh... I started our quantity quantity surveying practice with my wife in 1979 and we still run that practice today together. It's been up and down in size, maybe as much as 30 people at times. But um, so uh, we early on in our career, in 1983, uh, we would have been the first people to take on uh, programming, construction programming as part of our business. And so we become, became more of a project controls business. I wouldn't say project management, but very much project controls. And, uh, and when I overlay on that, uh, the fact that uh, I've always had an abiding interest in, in computers and technology, um, it's led us to where we are today. Hmm. That doesn't surprise me that you're one of the first people to do that because uh, you, from our conversation, seem like a first adopter. <laughs> ah, yeah, I've, st- I've still got the nine-inch floppy disk on my shelf. <laughs> my 20 megabytes it held. <laughs> um, so you also are a registered adjudicator? Yes, we, we really moved across into the world of adjudication and dispute resolution um, when... The, uh, the first Security Payment Act came into Queensland and uh, we've enjoyed that. We wrote our own software to uh, appoint and manage adjudications and, uh, and then after the, uh, after the QBCC took it on, uh, we basically became an advisory role. So we were doing advisory work at that time. Um, we started writing a fair bit of software because what we could see was that the contractors, particularly the subcontractors, uh, weren't really getting it right. And, of course, entitlement is everything and they weren't maintaining their entitlements. And so everything we did was focused on trying to help people uh, to maintain their entitlement at the same time keep jobs going because you can't stop a construction job once it starts. 
Mm. So, and that's where we've been and it's been a wonderful ride. Mm. Yeah. You can thank Michael for the... For Adjud- those adjudications. The early, the early adjudications, <laughs> eh? Yeah. It, uh, it was interesting. It was been, um, I look back on my involvement in those uh, those early days in terms of getting the uh, the initial adjudication or su- security payment reforms in and the process has stood up pretty well. Uh, when I, when I, the process they stood up pretty well. How it, how it how it continues in the future? I'm not too sure, but um, it's been it's it's. it's I think it has. I, I mean, I, from our perspective, I, we've uh, we've helped a lot of people, yes. and um, and I think the process has been pretty fair and reasonable. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in the course of time, uh, it, I would like to think it would coalesce more around uh, the technical expertise, mm-hmm. uh, where uh, and, and the reason for that is because, as you know, with an adjudication, you don't have the ability to be able to inquire past the point of the application. So you can't cross-examine people, and you can't you can't get particulars and all that sort of stuff. So there's a, a lot of um, technical knowledge that may be required, is often required, to see behind the curtain and understand what's going on. But uh, yeah, it'll continue well and hopefully continue well in, into the future. Mm. So another passion of yours and the reason why, well, the primary topic that we're going to talk about today um, is uh, the smart contracts and the blockchain and the rules-based um, approach before we jump into that, what are some of the key challenges that you are seeing in the construction industry that are spurring you on to look more into these this tech space and, and that as a solution? Well, I think what's happened, uh, recent world events have caused us all to take a breath and, and look at the industry at large and work out what the real challenges are and where we think it's going to have to go in the future. Now, uh, fairly recently, it all seems to have have come together in some respects. We all understand what the key issues are. Mm -hmm. And the key issues are stall productivity, productivity is going nowhere, the uh, inability to to, uh, to, uh, obtain a a good workforce, a good, well-educated, willing workforce, and there are all kinds of reasons for that, Mental health problems we know is a huge problem in the industry. Um, and the last one is uh, data analytics, which is becoming a big deal um, in everything else uh, except our world uh, because we're not collecting and collating the data correctly. And uh, the people in the UK and Australia are starting to really talk about that, understand what's got to happen to, to really create some proper data analytics. And they're the challenges. Not a lot of challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, they're all tough ones. Yeah. Mm. I think you'd have to be hiding under a rock not to see lots of commentary around those, all of those challenges mm. in articles and in LinkedIn posts. Mm. And, it, and, yeah, I'm, I'm a freshie mm. <laughs> and I'm, I'm constantly seeing that and, well, that's a lot of the topics that we're trying to talk about in our, in our podcast series and mm. achieve a conversation mm. about proper action plans that people can put into place. Do you see artificial intelligence as a, as a threat or as a opportunity? Ooh, that's a good one. Oh, it's very much an opportunity, very much an opportunity. Um, if you look at the research, the, the construction industry uh, is not under threat uh, for employment particularly, and I think you pointed out that, that there's a huge deficit in, uh, in construction, particularly in the management side of construction. So that's not a problem. Um, but what the research is telling us is artificial intelligence, intelligence will augment what we're doing. It will make it better. It'll make jobs more certain, uh, better outcomes for clients, um, and less stress on, on everyone who's working in the industry. It's definitely a win-win situation. What do you think about when, um, say, we've seen, I see it, saw a post or 
something the other day that said in 10 years, AI means that there will be no um, quantity surveyors in a role. What, what would your response to that be? Well, I mean, similar things are said about lawyers. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, look, I mean, there's always going to be a role for, for people in the industry. Um, and I think a lot of the role for people like quantity surveyors is, is actually creating the environment, creating the applications mm -hmm. for uh, for uh, augmented uh, intelligence or augmented, uh, and and what will happen? And it's a long way to go yet. Um, we haven't even started yet to standardise definitions of uh, in work breakdown structures. Mm -hmm. That hasn't even begun. Oh, it's kind of begun in a little way, but it's it's not big. And uh, I've always seen that as as part of a quantity surveyor's role. In fact, I've always seen for many years uh, that the quantity surveyor's role is all about work definition. Mm. The thing about that, I shared that, that post about, you know, 10 years' time there'll be no QSs or project managers or anything like this. The point it was that there will be, there'll be a need for good ones with good communication skills to, 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 you know, unpack the information, pass it on, Make sure you to explain it. Mm, correct. Um, so mm. um, it's yeah, it's the data. The industry has just missed so many opportunities in the past to collect data and feed it back in to get better outcomes. So that, that's where I see absolutely AI mm. to be a, yes. a huge plus. Humans are going to have to good good people with good communication skills are going to have to put it put that in context and pass it on and communicate it to people so that people understand what that data means. Quite so. And, of course, uh, coming from where, where I am, everything old is new again mm. because I know that uh, 30, 40 years ago uh, we were collecting this data. The quantity surveying fraternity was very collaborative. We would always hand this data over. It was all done through the institute, and uh, and it was all then disseminated. We all had everyone's information about the cost of this and that, because I think people uh, understood back then that a healthy profession was a springboard for a healthy business. So we didn't we didn't silo our data. We weren't dog in the manger about anything at all, um, and it, and it worked. And there's no reason at all why that can't be regenerated, especially now because we've got the ability to do all this really easily and mostly automatically. It's a bit of a theme that we've had from a couple of our guests, but you touched on it then, is that... Sharing is caring. Sharing is caring, and so people have got to think in terms of what's best for the industry. Yes, of course. Not, not so much what's best for them. So, you know, that, that's a mindset change. If you, if you think upon those lines, um, it's, it's, it's been a common theme. It, it has been, yeah. So... Um, what what are the reasons for those issues? Like what are the key reasons? We you kind of collected oh, a bit of a list. If we put, if I we think we've been we've been talking about this. Yeah. Um, Michael and I were talking about about uh, risk averse contracting. Mm -hmm. Now, risk averse contracting was 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 really started to come into the fore. I think probably about 19, in the mid 1970s, 1980. It's been around quite a long time. Um, and, and that's driven people to silo information at every level, um, to be distrustful of one another. And uh, uh, the outcome hasn't been good in the end of the day uh, because this, uh, this desire to uh, sell risk down the chain doesn't work. You end up selling it to people who have absolutely no ability whatsoever to either manage it or pay for it if it goes wrong. So uh, they're the sorts of issues that, that now have to change. The other thing, of course, is, is that I think it's important now for clients to understand that by, by not owning the data, um, they're giving away their most valuable asset. Um, they, they were convinced at one time that it was a really good idea to not own the data because it meant you didn't have the risk. Uh, but what's in fact happened is they've given away a very valuable asset that they can they can own, can use, can can re reuse. 
I mean, all that data can be reused for facilities management, all those sorts of ownership issues. In the end of the day, they can even sell it. So it, it's going to be the, the most valuable commodity and clients and governments need to understand that and they will do. Do you remember that shift in attitude? What do you think caused that lack of trust? And, and I mean, I, I, how, look, how can people have gone from... I, I, think that la- I think that lack of trust was really driven by risk-averse contracting and, and, and uh, trying, to, trying to silo yourself from everybody else mm-hmm. and pass that risk through to people further down the chain. Um, uh, people and that and that that drove the distrust and so on. Now, lay it on top of that, there, there's a lot of uh, the management became more aggressive. So instead of instead of real competence, um, it it became just aggressive, and uh, that creates disputes and so on as well. So all those things layer on one another. Not wanting to put my brothers and sisters offside and who work in the government government area, but you know, government's got a lot to it can it can herald in bad changes and it can herald in good changes. So I think a lot of this stuff happened in the 80s from a, from a, you know, a, a belief that the taxpayer's dollar had to be looked after at all stages. So that, you know, there was, I think, I think a lot of government procurement requirements in those days were really, really um, driving hard at the head contractor. And of course the head contractor just looked to, you know, off, quite often engage in the lowest price so what do you do if you're head contractor trying to get a bit of a profit? You, you know, you, you push down the risk and you also the the capacity to cause disputes with subcontractors and all that sort of stuff. So I think one of the changes coming forward is that I would hope, and I think I see this conversation a lot, is that government needs to lead through its own behaviour how it procures. It's got to procure not just on the cheapest price, it's got to procure on a whole lot of, you know, a broader broader issue in terms of social social issues and also sustainability for all. Very definitely, and, and you're right. Uh, governments are the biggest clients in the country by a long way, and they do lead the way. Um, a, a really good example of this was in the uh, mid-'80s when the Queensland government, uh, through the then Works Department, decided that they wanted contractors to have proper uh, construction programs, and, and they engaged people like us to, to create them, and not only create them, but to manage them on the way through. And the standard of construction planning of, went, just went through the roof. When they dropped those requirements later on, probably 10 years later, the standard immediately fell. So you're absolutely right. Governments will drive change and improvement in that way. Mm. Yeah. Mm. We were talking to Robert Sabira from the ACA in our last uh, episode recording and that was a topic that we touched on, the model client. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, without being too much of downer <laughs> on all the problems and, and being the problem solvers and forward thinkers that we want to be, what are some enablers that are ready or imminent that you can identify um, and know that we were talking about and, and you've written some fantastic articles about um, shared, ru- shared rules-based data? Um, uh, what, when you talk about rules-based, what do you mean by that? Okay, well, um, for starters... Shared rules-based data is, is one of the first things we can do to open up collaboration. Now, the beauty of it is, the wonderful thing about it is, we know how to do it. We've done it many times before, but in the past it was all manual. Nowadays, it doesn't have to be all manual. There's a lot of, lot of assistance we can get from technology to make this happen. So we can make it happen again, um, but better in the future. Um, Rules-based data is pretty straightforward, really. I mean, uh, I think I mentioned before, the quantity surveying world should take control of work definition, and that includes work definition. Of, uh, so, for example, um, we, would, we would measure uh, all the um, estimating by building element, very simple way to do things. That can then be converted to trade, 
which creates the contracts that you want to that you want to engage people on. Um, you can then convert all that to activities, and under, once you've got activities, then you can plan the job. You can pay your progress payments automatically based on activities. Um, you can then look at at, uh, at work definitions for um, objects or object definitions for your uh, for your BIM, and uh, once you've got object definitions, then you can automate specifications, you can automate the pricing, all that sort of thing can fall into place. And that, that's still in the future, but it's all there. We know exactly how to do it. We've just got to do it. And so is that done on a platform? Is it, is it, is that, what, what kind of resource do you use to do that? Oh, be, be, oh look, it's not particularly a platform. I think there's a lot of it is, is just a, a written down process. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be on any number of platforms, um, but, but the technology will help. Um, no, <clears throat> that, that basically will, will be just agreed. I mean, in order to get these things the, uh, promulgated around, around the world, around the country, you've essentially got to have standards. And that's really what we're talking about here is creating standards. So data standards. That was so my it's data next. Stand, standards <laughs> as opposed to technical it's, standards. It's, it's data standards, yeah. 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 So, there's, so there's a, you're talking about standard data, data standards? St- data standards, yeah. Yeah. So that so that the data is uniformly captured. That's right. From a from a from the same perspective and can be analysed from the same. Can be analysed from the same. One perspective. of the things that when we spoke to to Robert from the ACA the other day is that you know Robertson Co and some of the other I think it's Robertson Co down in New South Wales for New South Wales did the, did the first five day week mm-hmm. uh, contract of was a. Re, redoing of the Concord Repad Hospital, and they they brought in a university to analyse it, and there's been a report done, and all that sort of basis. But yeah, there's more contractors doing that five day work thing. So the opportunity he was saying then out of that was that obviously the more data you get from an industry perspective, the better. You've got different contractors yeah. pouring in, you know, the same, but it get it get and analyse, you know, all the stuff that you said as well as you know wellness, mental health. You know, work satisfaction, reduction of accidents on site, all that sort of thing, which is measurable, which then can drive um, whether or not there should be more of this type of contracting. Uh, and it's 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 data. Mm, very definitely, and and I mean <clears throat> things things like the the shared rules based data um, then opens just opens the door to everything because it opens the door to collaborative contracting. It opens the door to automations of all kinds. I mean, I've demonstrated already uh, how you can do earned value calculations automatically. Um, it's something that we all know should be done, but it's too expensive. Nobody does it. This, all this stuff can be done absolutely automatically. The, the real trick of it all is that you want to be able to, to run your, your, your um, virtual processes, which is all your management processes, uh, beside the physical processes and not disrupt the physical processes. The way contracts work at the moment is all the virtual processes disrupt the physical process and you get a lot of problems from that. You get claims and disputes. Uh, the, the way variations are handled, for example, it's just clumsy, really clumsy. Um, there are ways that that can happen below the surface. The work just goes on. So this rules-based shared data is a big deal and it's really simple and easy to implement. It's got to be one of the simplest things. And then, of course, at the end of it, it starts to produce the information that the data analysts want for the future. And uh, you get people like uh, uh, some of the people running AI now out of uh, Cambridge Oxford University and, and their spin-offs um, who are really pushing the, the use of uh, AI data analytics. So that, that, that's, th- these little starting points are not hard. They're not hard, they're not, not expensive, and they're going to help everybody. And that's the beauty of it all. Great yeah. information. Yeah. I'd encourage everyone to go, well, all your articles, but everyone listening should go and read your article, Rules-Based Shared Data for Financial Control of Major Projects. <laughs> Thank it's a good you. one. Yeah. It's a thinker. We'll, <laughs> I, um, we'll link it in there. Oh, yeah, we'll link it in the 
the show notes, but <laughs> I liked, I highlighted a few things in there um, before we skip off to the next topic that I liked that you said. Um, there is little understanding that managing risk is far more effective than contracting out of risk. I thought that those were profound words. Some, yeah, profound words. Um, can I tell you a little story? Yes, I you had can. A, I had a client. I had a client, no, and uh, he is a form worker. And uh, I gave, we gave a, a seminar years and years ago uh, for the construction industry. Uh, who, two, two people turned up. One of them was, was government and the other one was a form worker. And uh, we had a set of slides and uh, we went through risk management and all the issues, all the, all the high risk things in contracts, okay? So he went away and uh, I hadn't heard from him since. I mean, that was 15 years ago. And he rang me one day and he said, oh, he said, when I go to, when I go to sign up a, a new contract, he said, I, I've got your slides on my, my laptop and I open it up. And he said, and as we go through the contract, I look at it and go, no, I don't like that one, take that out. No, I don't like that one. Take that out. And he said, I've never had a problem since from that day to this. So, and he's, so, he's been using it as a ready reckoner for he, 15 years. He's been using it as a ready reckoner for all that time. Yeah. Do you even uh, think that well, those moments when you're showing those slides, that it would have that much of an impact on him? But that's that's must have felt good to hear the, that feedback. I'm absolutely delighted that he's yeah. not a client anymore. <laughs> 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 because he's he's successful. He's he's, he's, he's solved all the problems. He doesn't have, doesn't have disputes. He's terrific. I and um, so we know we know that you've said shared rules based data is an enabler of collaborative contracting. And how else do you think that we can get? Well, we can. Everyone will jump on board this collaborative contracting train and and start to maybe make less risk of averse contracts or or kind of incorporate elements of collaborative contracting into their process. I really think it's it's the, the key to it all is clients and governments uh, who who. Uh, we would like to uh, educate to the point where they understand that owning the data and using the data is their most valuable asset. That's number one. Once they do that, then you can start to spread that out in, into collaborative contract. And they'll figure out pretty quickly that collaborative contracting works much better uh, than hard dollar contracting because you can change things without a disaster. Um, I've had, a, had an instance recently, which is a complete disaster, uh, a school job uh, that was clearly uh, uh, over budget at the tender price. And of course, it all had to be rejigged more or less on the fly. Well, you can imagine the money and the angst and, uh, and the, the problems that, that that generates. It doesn't have to be like that. Mm -hmm. Now, fast track, fast track contracting is a great way to build great way to build, uh, provided the owners understand that it does cost money. So if you want to fast track a contract really well, you're probably going to have to say, okay, I'm going to set aside 5% to manage that process because it does have to be carefully managed. But once once owners uh, get hold of that, it's a very nice way to, to do business. So we've just got to keep hammering away. Yeah. Mm. There's a lot of conversations about that at the moment too. It seems a bit of a, a buzzword. And so how about um, training and, and retraining? Oh, look, um, what we're finding, and, and we get a lot of feedback from subcontractors on this, um, that the, the people coming through uh, acting as contract managers um, are uh, not doing a good job. They don't understand the work. Um, many of them are far too aggressive. 
but they're not doing their own job properly. So they don't know how to program a job. They don't know how to manage a program. They don't know how to manage the process. And of course, disputes arise and conflict arises. So uh, if we can pull that, that aggressive behaviour out by better contracts, um, then it'll allow these people to, to, to uh, really bring their competencies to the fore and, and their competencies should be uh, running people, mm -hmm. managing a contract, understanding how to program, what's good. And, you know, I know myself uh, that uh, the little uh, IT projects that I'm running at the moment, uh, I've got a situation where people can put their timesheet in every day, every day, it gets fired off to the programming system every day. And I can look at it every afternoon and know exactly what's been done today and what we've got to do tomorrow. It's all there. It's just ready to access. It's like it's like low-hanging low fruit, just mm. too easy. Mm. Yeah. And when we were having our pre-podcast chat and we were talking about that automation, you were even, I mean, you got us thinking about all the different um, admin requirements and notice requirements um, under these huge contracts, which through maybe one of those apps or online systems, even when as simple as it comes to um, weather or something happening on site, take a photo, do a quick notice in, in there on your phone and it goes through just like that and skips a couple of people that maybe it would have had to get sent to and written up. And it seems, it seems wild that maybe these Word document notices are being used when you said that it could just happen automatically. automatically. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting. And I, and I do think that uh, the subcontractors uh, will be overjoyed if someone takes some of the weight off their shoulders. Mm. What the one you suggested is a great example. There's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't have a weather vane or a, a system on every construction site um, that fires information directly to the programmer. And the programmer works decides who gets an extension time and just tells them. So nobody has to ask. They don't have to beg. They don't have to fight. They don't have to think about it. They just get told. And, and we've done this... Uh, over the years with subcontractors and variations. Uh, honestly, if you tell them what, what they're going to get, they don't have to beg for it, they don't have to fight for it, they don't have to look for everything, uh, hope, look under every rock. You just say, this is a variation, here's the money. They love it. Mm -hmm. They absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, um, uh, there, there's a lot of benefits to everybody, I mean, in every way, financially, uh, and, uh, and, and personally as well. So what you're saying in terms of the weather vane is that it just, the information's just shot through and the decision is made based on the data that you don't have to claim anything, extensions of time, or it, it's, it's acknowledged as something needs to be adjusted and the adjustment just flows, which, which is, means that, you know, that whole contractual, you know, notices and all that sort of stuff, which is just, in many instances, designed to trick contractors up, yeah. um, you know, the dual notices and all that sort of stuff, you do away with that sort of thing. And it's all part of, it's all part of, uh, of, of preventing the, the construction process from being inhibited mm -hmm. because if you've got to start spending all your time thinking about making a claim for this and that and I can't start work on, a, on an instruction because I think it's a variation and I've got to tell you and you've got to come back and approve it, I mean... Mm -hmm that's going to take a fortnight and the job's got to keep going. And these are the problems. This is why you end up in dispute. Um, it's really interesting. I mean, uh, the, the latest book by Ben Flyberg, the guy at, uh, at Oxford University, uh, he, they all talk about plan slowly, build fast. And this is on the mega projects. Don't just launch into the job. Plan the job, plan slow, build fast. That's the name of the game. So what you're saying there, and I think you used it, and I'll get you to repeat it, uh, the analogy is that, the, is that the, nothing should interrupt. The, the, most, the most important thing is that the construction program is not interrupted. Absolutely. So 
And what did you say is interrupting at the moment? The, the it's it's all this all this virtual process, the virtual process, uh, uh, instructions and variations, and 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 uh, weather events and delays. All of those things require this this to and fro iterative process that is completely unnecessary. And the virtual processes are locked into the contract, and they're locked into the contract. So, yeah. so to un, untie all this sort of thing, the contracts have to be different. Exactly. That's right. The contracts have to be different and, and the process is then different. Contract should follow the process, not the other way around. Contract should follow the process, not the contract dictate the process. Dictate the process, yeah. Which is probably what's happened to date. It has, yes. That's, that's kind of where it's gone. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. And, of course, that's all going to change again because, Emily, you talked about, about business process automation and, and that's huge that every almost – Almost every element of, of the virtual processes is going to be automated to some extent. I, I've started working um, on the smart contract that we talked about, and the very first phase of that is, is the fair deal proposal, which is the procurement phase, which gets you from calling for bids through to uh, uh, establishing a contract. Um, but that can be automated, and, and the big thing with that is uh, you can create a trustworthy system. At the moment, it's not trustworthy, and I, believe, I sincerely believe that many of the uh, managers of major contractors have no idea what their uh, contract managers are doing on the ground. They'd be horrified to know uh, some of the things that go on, and, uh, and that can be cut out by creating a a trusted, auditable process. Once you get to the end of that process, then all of that process can be run into a smart contract, talking about the financial flow, um, whereby everything depends on people doing what they're meant to do. So your entitlement is triggered by the fact that you have to do certain things. Once it's triggered, no one can change that. The money just flows. And so, John, when you talk about a smart contract, if, you, if you're doing basics 101, what is a smart contract? The, 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 the smart contract apps are, are really all uh, coming out of the, the world of uh, Web3 and blockchain. And essentially, they create uh, a, uh, a ledger of every transaction that can't be modified. So there's no transaction that can be modified or changed. You can change things along the way, but everything is audited and every transaction is, is in, a, in a fixed ledger. That's essentially how the system works. Yeah. Um, and that creates this trust that, that runs through something like that. So you have your parties and you're going, you go to this website or platform and you nobody can nobody can edit it nobody can edit it yeah. yeah that can only be edited by agreement between the parties yeah. that's the only way it can be edited yeah i think um it's maybe where a little bit of resistance happens is because people think and i mean i've learned about it a few times and they're teaching smart contracts at uni now and blockchain and is going, oh, this is all too hard. This is confusing. This is all too hard. It's taking effort and then getting stuck back without moving forward into this world. Do you think that's what, why people might not have been jumping on board? No, earlier? not really, because I think that once it starts, what we're going to find is that all the clever blockchain stuff is all happening in the background. Mm -hmm. People are still going to do what they're required to do. Um, it, a lot of it will be automated. Uh, it'll be a lot simpler. Mm. It won't disrupt the, the physical process. Um, but all the other stuff will just, just be in the background. They will never know what a blockchain is if they don't want to. Just in, slightly off what we're talking about, but I just don't want to lose the train of thought before. One of the things that I've sort of always wondered in the back of my mind is how much data 
is now collected by sensors and in terms of that, say, in terms of builders buildings after they've been completed. You know, you can you can set up so much data in terms of use of use of rooms and you know air conditioning and all sorts of what is you know what is not used, what's not used, when to use it. You know, even you know the way in which corridors work and everything like that. Do you think? Do you think that needs to? Is that is that sort of data being fed back into the construction thinking of how to build? You know, if you to me, there's a whole lot of buildings that have always been built which have been inefficient, and yeah, the data yeah, now shows that they're inefficient. That's right. So, are we building differently based on that data being well, collected? Well, sadly, I mean, the quantity surveyors have been promoting this idea of lifelong projects um, since since I was thirty. I mean, a long time, and but it's been a struggle to get people to take it up. The, the whole idea of using that data for the entire life of the project and feeding it back in all the sorts of ways you talk about. Um, it, it's on the agenda again, and one would hope that once we start to get these more collaborative things going, um, that that will happen, that this data will come out and be able to be used for all kinds of reasons. Why would you build a a conference room on level six if a conference room has never been used, Joe. You know, if, 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 if the data can show that based on a certain, you know, occupation or, you know, whatever the, the yes. purpose is, why would you – surely that's senseless feedback back into the design and the, the whole of, of a building saying, well, you know, the data shows that you don't need – three conference rooms or you maybe you need some sort of multifaceted area, you know, something different than in terms of usage. And to me, it's just, I know that there's now buildings, well, I think they're called smart buildings, you know, where the data is just massively collected in terms of usage and when it's used yeah. and you can turn on air conditioning to make it more efficient and everything like that. But it always says to me, well, that, that data should be driving how buildings are designed. And if buildings are designed that way, well, then you build to that. You know, it's that same. Yeah. No, I think you're right. A lot of it gets lost along the way. And, uh, and this is a challenge for the designers, really, to do the same as what we're trying to do with the financial data, is to uh, is to gather that data. And of course, these days, uh, the, the big thing with AI, I talk about about rules based structured data. Um, now, that may or may not be wholly correct. Um, we're, what we're probably more likely looking at is trainable data, just as the the, the large language models. Are trainable and you can see what they do. They'll do. They'll write software now, and uh, there's some very, very interesting things happening in that world, where software won't be necessarily um, uh, done in the way it's done. It'll be more cognitive in the way it's produced. Yeah. A whole other world. Yeah, and and all and this will flow through. And I think so. It's very likely that a lot of this data will be rather more trainable than and structured for people to have to go and look at it. It'll work differently. So you'll be able to inquire on it just as we do with chat GPT, for example, and yeah. uh, and get responses, yeah. I've been playing around with a bit of that recently <laughs> just to yeah. see how accurate it is. And... Yeah, because yeah, it's it'll only ever tell you, it'll only ever tell you what's happened in the past because it has no future. You can't think ahead. Or well, come back to data. That's, that's the biggest problem I've got with it so far, some of the stuff that's... Yeah. When I've gone to re-verify some of the stuff that I've been told, I'm not happy with the data. But you know, that's but everything else. Um, I did a side by side comparison in terms of um, performance solutions under the building code. You know what I mean? So I just I just wanted to look at what 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 was being said there under the net because it's a mystery. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, and um, it's not bad, uh, but it's. It really didn't demystify <laughs> no, <laughs> that no. whole world, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, no, it's 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 got its purposes as a base. Yes, that's right. To, to go off and make some further yeah. further inquiries, and it's going to improve very quickly. Oh. Yeah, no question. But in our world, we've got to figure out how to get that data. That's it together, mm. that's it. and that's the big challenge, or well, one of the big challenges. Mm. I think. Um... That's a good time to say that the good news is change isn't hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, you see, all the things we've talked about, uh, they're not difficult. We know most of it. Much of it we've done before. Um, 
more manually than we would want to do it now. Mm. Um, so the, the knowledge is there, the wisdom is there. Um, it, it's not too difficult and the benefits are going to be absolutely staggering. Jobs will get better, clients will have more predictable results. Um, it, it's just going to be better. Insurers will be happier. That's right. I, years ago, just, just going back one step, which just shows you how important this sort of process is, um, I, I heard a paper from a Japanese guy who'd been working in London at one of our um, international cost engineering conferences. And uh, he was a bit mystified that the, the Western method of construction was all based on, on the, the gun project manager. You've got this gun project manager and he's responsible for everything. Mm -hmm. And what happens, of course, is, is the construction companies have very patchy results. You've got this guy here who's producing fabulous results, someone over here is producing very bad results. And I've seen it locally with a local builder here um, where one office is doing really well, got great reputation. The, the one down the road is, is awful. You know, can't finish their jobs, got a terrible reputation, the subbies hate them. And how could you have that kind of difference in one business? This guy was saying he was absolutely mystified and he said, oh, you know, in Japan it's never been like that. It's all about process. Everyone follows the process and they don't have these high-flying project managers. You just, just follow the process. And we, we're going to find ourselves doing more of that. A long time ago, we had uh, built a major project on a construction management basis and um, uh, one of our guys discovered that uh, two fellows who were letting the subcontracts um, were manipulating the system. Basically, they, they were... Uh, waiting for, for the bids to come in and then uh, on, a, on a fax back in those days and then they'd, they'd ring their mate and say, here's the price you've got to give and sling us 10 grand as well. And uh, when they were found out, they were just moved on to another job. I mean, we, we wouldn't have a bar of them, but they were just nice. moved away. So, and it's those sorts of things, the fair deal the process would just stop that in its tracks, absolutely eliminate that sort of behaviour, and people start to trust one another, which is really what it's all about. Yeah. So honestly, I think um, in the end of the day, I mean, it really is a win-win game, isn't it? We're going to we're going to make projects more predictive, predictable for clients. We'll get better data to use now and in the future. We'll have less stress on individuals. They won't be pushed to do work out of order or in places where they shouldn't be doing it or, or you know, you've got to stay on and finish this because someone else didn't perform. Uh, all those sorts of things will fade away. Um, the mental health problem will, will be reduced because mental health problems are all about those sorts of issues. When you look at uh, uh, mates in construction, uh, you look at the problems, that's what they are. Oh, yeah. When we were talking to Mikhail Heinonen, he'd created this big map. It was a web. It was all the problems and they were all linking to each other. It was quite extraordinary, the map that he created. But, yeah, it was, it was an interesting to look at. Well, um, who, I guess my final question would be is, this is win, 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 win. Who is the call to action from this podcast chat to make, to see that change through? Everyone in the industry to, to jump on board and be in this? What needs to happen before we can all? I think everyone in, the, everyone in the industry is responsible. And uh, yeah, I, as I, it struck me yesterday to, uh, to, to propose a, a, a conference of and a work, workshops of, of all the players to come in, throw their problems on the table, throw their solutions on the table, um, and more importantly, convince governments and clients that they're going to get a much better outcome in every respect. And it's not hard. Yeah. It really I've, is not hard. I've long said that the solutions for the construction industry should be come from the construction industry. Yeah. And sitting back waiting for government to solve the problems I think is unfair on government, but it just hasn't worked either. Right. Just has not worked. So, you know, um, it's really time for the industry to step up um, and, and aggressively come forward with collaborative solutions 
that the government almost has to say, well, thanks for coming with a solution rather than a problem. Yeah. Um, because I'm repeating myself, yeah. it's government driving solutions to the industry has, has not worked. They, governments could in, put in good frameworks like basic things like, you know, let's have a basic, good, strong, you know, licensing regime and you can, you can do that sort of thing. But driving major change like this can't, can't be driven by government. It's, no. it's got to be driven by the industry with support by the government. That's right. It, it governments uh, governments act as responsible clients. Yep. That's really all, the, all we can ask for. That's the best thing they can do. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us, John. And I have learnt a lot. Can't wait to see what more that you publish and do in this space. And unco- I encourage everyone to go and read all of your articles um because they're fascinating <laughs> uh yeah thank you well thank you emily thank you michael it's been a pleasure to join you and have a chat i hope you enjoyed the podcast today the information we discussed today was just that information only it is not specific advice if you take action following something you heard today it is important to make sure you get professional advice about your unique situation before you proceed, whether whether that advice be legal, financial, accounting, medical or other advice. Please reach out to the Helix team if you have any questions or if there's another topic you'd like to explore. And if you know someone who might benefit from the show, remember to tell them about it or point them to our Instagram, Facebook or LinkedIn. (laughs) 